I'm excited to welcome you to our session today on acceleration of digital health in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, today's session is a combination of highlighting technical tools for digital health assessment, preparedness and evaluation and real on the ground experience with digital health acceleration during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm happy and honored to introduce our team today. First, our special guest this morning from Uruguay's Digital Health Initiative, uh, Salud Punto Ue, or Uruguay, Mr. Pablo Orifici. Um, I know he's proud of my Spanish right now. Um, Pablo is a computer engineer by training with a master's degree in health services management. He has extensive experience in managing large scale projects and especially in the area of digital health. Within his work at the Digital Health Initiative, he's implemented the design and operation of the Health Interoperability National Platform, and um, as well as the National Electronic Medical Registry of Oncology and the Integrated Network for Diagnostic Imaging. He represents Uruguay in the General Assembly before the international organization SNOMED and the Global Digital Health Partnership. He also represents Uruguay in the Regional Steering Committee in the American Network for Cooperation on Electronic Health and participates in the SBC WHO Working Group. He is currently Senior Advisor on the Digital Health at the IDB and was an advisor to the former Chilean Minister of Health in the sector's digital transformation process. Um, finally, he participated in the creation of the digital health agendas and their roadmaps for ministries of health of Paraguay, El Salvador, Peru, and Ecuador. A warm welcome to Pablo. And from the World Bank, my very own health nutrition and population digital health team, I'd like to introduce our leader in digital innovation and health system analytics, Marlies Gorgens, and Gabriel Catan, our digital health specialist. Finally, Tommy Wilkinson, our senior health economist. economist sorry. Um, please feel free throughout the session to drop your questions in the chat. And at the end, if we still have time, we'll open to Q&A. So from there, I'll let Marlies take it away. Marlies, are you muted still? I think if we want to discuss digital health and the opportunity of digital health in a COVID and post-COVID era, it's important that we acknowledge and start with the problems that we have. We know that even before COVID, clients of health systems, health system providers, um, healthcare providers, health system administrators, and at the health system itself, there have been significant and persistent problems for which we know that we need new solutions if we want to really transform, reimagine healthcare, particularly primary healthcare, and focus on how to deliver high quality, equitable, and client centered, client centered care. Next slide, thanks, Jessica. Um, we know that these problems have only been exacerbated by COVID. We know that it has brought additional pressure in terms of system capacity. We know that it has brought additional pressure in terms of deciding how to prioritize health services. It has also brought additional challenges in terms of the perspective of people who want to access healthcare and who want to improve their, their own health. So the question is, how can we use digital health um, in this challenging environment, how can we use digital health to improve and to expand, to use this as an opportunity to not just use digital health solutions for COVID-19 in a short-term siloed way, but to really use it in an integrated way. And as we build solutions for COVID to simultaneously concomitantly improve the system as well. Next slide. What does a reimagined primary healthcare system look like? The system that I've just described, that is reimagined primary healthcare for health, the health system itself, for health system administrators, for the clients, for people who want to improve their health, and for healthcare providers. 
think it's fair to say that um, what is different about and how primary healthcare can be different, it needs to be responsive, coordinated and not siloed in the way that services are currently provided. Um, it needs to be efficient and accessible. It needs to be equitable and of high quality. And then I think some of the things that digital technology particularly enables us to do is these last three in that we can um, think about using digital health technologies to deliver services that are innovative, um, to deliver differentiated services that um, is based not just on the needs, but on the preferences of clients. And that might mean the same service delivered in different ways for different clients. In order to um, get to this reimagined primary healthcare, um, at the World Bank, we are about to launch a report that talks about the fact that there are four paradigm shifts in primary healthcare needed, from gatekeeping to quality comprehensive care, from fragmentation to client-centered integration, from inequities to fairness and accountability, and from fragile to resilient health systems. And we know that's particularly important in light of COVID. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so how does all of this link back to, to digital health? Well, we know that digital health is an essential component of achieving these four paradigm shifts to get to that reimagined primary healthcare. And as I hand over to my colleagues for the rest of the session, just to say that I think this is really the crux of the matter, that if we want to, if we want to do digital health different, if we want to not have a thousand flowers bloom, not have the current immense fragmentation that we have, we have to focus on um, not digital health as the solution in and of itself, but digital health in relation to the, the healthcare system and particularly think about how do we provide, how do we reimagine primary healthcare? And then what is, what is the role of digital health within that? And not think of digital health as the solution in and of itself, because what we really want to do is change how we provide services and how primary healthcare works. And that is enabled by, by digital health as a means to and end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you everyone for being here. So uh, the, the part of this digital health implementations, I think start by, by understanding the concept of what is a digital disruption and healthcare should go through a digital disruption. And this disruption is not about only a transformation or, or an evolution, but it's actually a radical change in the way we do things the way we provide things, in the way which tools are we using, and 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 how we use the inputs and out and interpret the outputs of, of these digital health interventions. It implies also change in the mindset in the culture of all people. And I think in the the engine for these digital health inter interventions is the understanding the potential of data, what we can do with uh, with data. Next slide, please. And so what is digital health? And probably you heard about a lot of definitions. So basically it's the utilization of information and communication technologies, what we in the past call e-health. But now we, uh, we include uh, another layer that's the utilization of, of cognitive computing, AI, big data, uh, machine learning, and other advanced uh, technologies for providing healthcare, for health literacy, uh, for uh, also digital health skills as well, and finally to provide better healthcare services. And when we think about digital health and digital health interventions, we can um, have these four classifications. Uh, sorry, Jess, thank you. Uh, these four uh, types of classification, and as you see, it's based basically on, on the end user. If they are the patients, the health system managers, the healthcare provides on that services, this is a classification from WHO. So if you think, for example, about a digital health intervention such as uh, telemonitoring or reminders or um, sensors, so you th may think about, for example, patients. But when you, when you talk about uh, health information management systems or uh, automating a uh, process, administrative process. So you are thinking about uh, digital health interventions for healthcare providers and health system managers. Next slide. And, and so, so as Merle mentioned, COVID has provided this incredible opportunity that probably without COVID may take 
a couple of years uh, to implement digital health or to think about the value of digital health, but COVID has exposed this value as how can we use digital health to reduce the gaps and increase coverage and increase access and increase access to better service and better quality. So, um, but, but when we think about uh, this opportunity, we need to be careful and do it effectively and smarter. Next slide. Um, so one of the things is, is, and why we need to rethink the way we use digital health as well is because there are so many challenges yet, especially in low middle income countries. Uh, there are kind of far behind in, in the development of digital health, but also that gap is an opportunity for leapfrogging to understand what others have been done already, what have other have been go, went through, uh, and lessons learned. And probably some of, of the, the challenges as well is this pilot, this phenomenon, as we heard in the past from WHO, in terms of many, many, many initiatives that are not finally operationalized or materialized in the long term. So a lot of investment and effort put on something that it is not useful afterwards. And probably some of the, of the causes of that is the lack of data. Uh, we need to think about how can we produce new data, better data, so not to fall on the garbage in, garbage out problem. And also the lack of frameworks, uh, lack of regulation, the, 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 the pace when of development of digital health has been so fast that regulation cannot go in the same, in the same pace, but we need to, to have these regulations and, and frameworks and strategy that should be owned by governments and be managed and be uh, uh, conducted by, by governments. And, and therefore, next slide, please. And therefore, we need to start thinking, how can we measure? And measure implies a lot of things. And one of the things that we need to measure is really uh, different aspects of the ecosystem that will enable the implementation of digital health. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that we observe is that sometimes we are based to, yes, to think a lot in the technology, but we forgot that technology is only a mean for a final end that is really solving a problem, solving a challenge. And therefore, starting with a problem, I think solves at least 80% of any issues, but I would say, but thinking really about the problem, thinking about the, the end user, that should be our motivation when we think about how can we implement digital health and what kind of digital health solutions. So once we understand the, the problem, we understand who are the end users, thereafter we need to think about the technology, but always taking in account the level of maturity and the data and the digital skills that are in the context that we're working with. Also, we need to uh, observe what is going on in the regulatory and policy environment, the safety, security, and privacy. You don't want to end with applications that, for example, collect data for one purpose and thereafter is sent for another purpose, lowering the trust and the utilization by users. And also you want to think about, and we are going to talk uh, afterwards in this presentation, uh, about the evidence of impact and cost effectiveness analysis. And all the elements that you see in the slides basically are collected, but one instrument we think is like the first step for this digital journey is the digital health assessment. Next slide. So what is a digital health assessment? And you probably heard about a lot of, of digital health tools. Most of them, they really, uh, provide a picture of what is happening uh, in terms of people, processes, technology, and organizational capabilities. And the approach that the World Bank, World Bank um, we are trying to think is putting all these digital health assessment together, pulling all the indicators in, in one place instead of creating new assessment. Because what we are going to see is that some of these assessments are very focused on, on specific areas, and you would like to have a comprehensive perspective of the digital health. Uh, next slide. Um, and so digital health assessment uh, are a very important tool to measure the ability of an organization to really improve, to set the bar, actually. But first, to understand what is the current status, to, to have a broader picture of what is happening in the country. And that will allow to set new paths, set new directions, set new strategies. These tools also help for benchmarking with their own country or with other countries, we need to be careful when, when selecting to which countries we need to benchmark. And by identifying the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, that this tool provides uh, an important input to prioritize 
digital health tools and rafter implementation to know where to invest, how to invest, and make the, the, the most successful results from it. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned in the past, there, there were a lot of digital health, and you may know some of them. Um, but uh, the, the issue is that because we were so much focused on e-health, most of these digital health assessment tools were focused on their architecture and data maturity, the infrastructure, the da databases, the interoperability and standards. But with the development of uh, um, big data and the amount of data that we are collecting from many, many places, uh, we need to think about this analytics maturity area as well to assess how countries are using data what are the digital skills in terms of data science, in, in, in terms of interpreting data? Because most of the countries probably are using a descriptive um, um, use of data, but we want to start moving towards the more predictive power of data um, to understand how can we use to, to make a more personalized service to patients? Um, how can we make decision, decisions insight driven, actually. And there is this another area with all development of a, uh, IoT sensors, robotics, this is the application. So the applications finally is, is kind of hardware and software that, that has this analytic engine and is based on the architecture, but finally is what the end user use and provides the answer and provides the solution to some of the healthcare challenges that the Marilis mentioned in the beginning. And these all three, these three areas should be covered by a governance level and any digital health assessment should cover all the four areas to create a comprehensive digital health system perspective. Next slide. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, as assessment are only a, a, a tool, but it are, they are an important tool as a first step for a digital health journey. Once we have this uh, assessment of the situation of a country in terms of maturity or readiness for digital health, that should be translated thereafter to a roadmap guidelines with clear steps where we want to go and how we want to go there, right? That the way we do things is also important. And therefore we need to prioritize in terms of what digital health interventions are more relevant based on the context of the country. And finally, we want to implement. We don't want to, again, do pilots, but we want to start doing things and implementing things to create transforming primary care as well. Um, next slide, please. And, and when we do this roadmap and implementation and prioritization, one of the things that we always talk between our team is that we need to start focusing on the low hanging fruit principle. So there are a lot of talkings about the importance of AI and, and cognitive computing. And for sure, these are very interesting topics, but sometimes uh, they are a little disconnected or they have a low adaptivity to the current context of low to middle income countries. For sure, AI can be a final destiny for a digital journey, but we need to think about the actual viability of these technologies also in terms of ethical AI, in terms of what are the inputs necessary to run these technologies, but also how can we interpret, interpret the outputs and that you need a lot of digital health skills and digital health capability to understand really the input that that's something that we also need to work through. And so that. therefore, sorry. Um, so, so, so therefore we, uh, we think that countries should start humble and start small. That means quick wins. Things to start implementing uh, small projects that they are kind of, we can see the output very quick and thereafter we can scale up. And probably the areas to focus are more the administrative tasks, the repetitive tasks, easy things that can be changed and have a, a great um, effect in changing and, and disrupting the, the way we do things. And just to end, um, so we understand the importance of assessment. We understand where we need to focus our efforts in terms of this long hanging fruit principle. So the, the next step is, so when we are designing the digital health interventions, what are the kind of features based on this assessment and based on this low hanging fruit principle? And what we learned in, the, in this last month through COVID is that any digital health intervention and not only for COVID should be easy to use because of the lack of digital health capabilities uh, still that we need to work through. Um, collect minimal necessary data, and it doesn't mean low level data, it just means what you really need and what you are really going to use at the end. 
Also, when we mention rapid implementation, we need more, more speed and less haste, uh, meaning that we need to act fast, but smarter thinking, not just uh, going in a rush and, and, and implementing uh, interventions that are not going to be used at the end. And, and we need to take into account as well, privacy and security. Flexible means that once COVID is sent, hopefully, maybe a new pandemics or endemics or other kind of uh, diseases that needs to be, uh, that can be overcome through digital health. And therefore these solutions that we are now investing for COVID should be capable to be used for other things. And most important, allow the continuity of care because these solutions will be only useful if they are provide, they are accessible, they are affordable, and they basically provide an answer to the so many healthcare challenges that healthcare system and patients are, 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 are going on. Um, and, and finally, so thinking about all this is very important because, uh, next slide, Jess, we don't want to finish uh, with this kind of, of things like the next slide shows, right? So it may be funny, but this is the truth. Many, many times we think about uh, fancy solutions, fancy technologies, incredible technologies based in, in AI. They may work fine, but it may get a lot of effort to get there. They may be good, but they are not user friendly. And sometimes they are really disconnected of the context. Thank you. And now we have Pablo, Hi. sorry. Um, we are still working on some interpretation. I've asked the interpreter if he can live translate. Daniel, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, it's going to be challenging because I won't be able to hear um, him very well, but we can do consecutive interpreting, meaning he speaks a little bit and then, you know, we interpret. That's going to take time though. Okay, so I, I, I must do the a slow presentation and I, I, I will be short, will be short on that, what it is. So next Great. slide, next slide, please. This is only a, a, a few indicators of my country. Uh, don't worry, only only to, to, to position our country as a 3.5 million post population. So next slide, please. Okay, I started in Spanish, Daniel. Um, Ur Uruguay representa este, un, un país que está avanzado en lo que tiene que ver con tecnología. Uruguay is a country that is quite advanced, technologically speaking. Están ahí descritas nuestras fortalezas y a su vez trabajamos fuertemente con la OPS, que es miembro de la OMS, con la asociación de SNOM Internacional, que es la terminología clínica más este, usada en el mundo. Somos parte de las naciones digitales y participamos de las redes de Global Digital Health a, a nivel mundial. So um, we are quite advanced technologically. We are a member of the um, Pan American Health Organization. We're also a member of uh, SNOMED International, and uh, we are also members of the Global Digital Health uh, Partnership uh, in uh, the uh, world. Next slide. Eh, construimos desde las bases, construimos políticas públicas que tienen que ver con el desarrollo digital de los gobiernos digitales, por sobre todas las cosas, y relacionados con la temática actual, tenemos objetivos sanitarios este, que se sostienen dentro de los objetivos este, globales de, de mundiales, y a su vez, eh, todos nuestros ciudadanos poseen acceso a sus historias clínicas digitales. So we are built from public policies and we also have um, health uh, goals uh, and those health goals are in line with uh, global health goals. All of our citizens uh, have access to their medical histories online. We have a digital system for medical um, records for our uh, citizens. Next slide. Tuvimos una reforma de salud hace 12 años que básicamente cambió el modelo de financiamiento, el modelo de gerenciamiento y el modelo en que se entrega la salud y se entendió que este cambio debía estar sustentado por un cambio en 
eh, con una apuesta, digamos, en lo que es eh, la salud digital. So 12 years ago, we had a change, a change in the way we manage health, a change in the, in the way we finance health. And um, this was a, a change that had a bet, and the bet was uh, to work towards uh, digital health. Can you press the button, please? That, that, that's our este, digital health uh, strategy. So next slide, please. Queremos que lo, lo más importante que hicimos y no lo hicimos este, basado en, 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 y lo hicimos basado en, en experiencia de otros países, básicamente es crear una, una iniciativa que estaba gobernada, está actualmente gobernada por la Presidencia de la República, el Ministerio de Economía y Finanzas, el Ministerio de Salud Pública y el Gobierno Digital. Básicamente ese proyecto es el que tiene encargado la salud digital en Uruguay. So basically, the most important thing is that uh, we um, actually based our um, system in, on other countries' experiences, and we have an initiative that we have started, and that initiative is uh, um, an initiative that has the backing of the President's Office of uh, Uruguay, the Ministry of the Economy, the Ministry of Health, and also the system of e-governance. Next slide. A su vez, trabajamos con todo el ecosistema de salud, público y privado, todos los actores que tienen que ver con la entrega de salud de alguna manera, con las universidades, la academia, con los colegios médicos, con el personal de salud profesional y no profesional, con los vendos y con las eh, organizaciones internacionales. We also work uh, in this uh, system with the Ministry of Public Health uh, and uh, other public state agencies. We also work with uh, public and private healthcare providers, pharmacies, laboratories, the medical colleges and scientific societies, universities and educational institutions, uh, and international organizations, as well as civil society and NGOs. Next slide. Aquí, aquí creo que es un poco lo que se venían eh, diciendo los los compañeros anteriores, los moderadores este, y los expositores anteriores. Básicamente, son proyectos de larga duración que tienen que tener entregas tempranas. Nosotros realizamos ya cuatro diagnósticos o mediciones, 2014, 2016, 2018 y 2020. Continuamente hay que estar midiendo, pero las estrategias y las líneas de acción también deben estar dadas desde, desde la cúpula política en lo que son las agendas digitales. So this is a long-term uh, project that uh, we have, uh, although we wanted to have early delivery as well. And um, uh, we um, also do four kinds of diagnosis, and we started doing this in 2014, 2016, 2018, and 2020. We also conduct the measuring exercises, and we have to have our strategies that are in line with the system as well. Lo primero que se hizo con la comunidad, eh, no, previous slides, please. Lo primero que se hizo con la comunidad fue, creamos la iniciativa por el 2012 y trabajamos con todo ese ecosistema en definir estándares y cuál era el modelo de intercambio de datos que quería Uruguay. So the first thing we do is we started with the initiative in 2012 when we set up uh, standards. And the first thing that we did as well is to set up the model and uh, uh, the data exchange system that we needed. This is uh, what we did because this is what um, we thought is what Uruguay wanted. E ese trabajo con la comunidad nos llevó hasta 2015, donde se, se realizó un plan de adopción para que todos los healthcare providers pudieran adoptar esta plataforma de intercambio y efectivamente en 2019 recién tuvimos producción sobre la misma. So we um, started in 2015, we uh, started working with uh, all the medical providers and uh, we wanted the medical providers to be able to adopt this platform and in 2019 we um, started uh, putting it uh, into practice, implementing it. Next slide. Básicamente, el gobierno entregó una plataforma de interoperabilidad para todo el sector, público y privado, centrado en el paciente, centrado en el usuario, donde el intercambio de información tiene como gran objetivo la continuidad asistencial. 
So basically what uh, we do is uh, the government uh, uh, introduced uh, this uh, system and it is a system uh, that is uh, centered on the patients, on the patient and um, it is based on the exchange of information and a work with the community. Next slide. Aquí lo que le mostramos es conceptualmente cómo es el plan de adopción, donde existen cinco etapas. Hoy todos los prestadores de salud están en la quinta etapa, pero tuvieron que pasar por estos escalones de a poco durante todos estos años para poder llegar al nivel de madurez actual. So basically what we have here is the adoption, adoption, adoption plan. Uh, the plan has five stages. We are now on the fifth stage for all providers, but um, all providers had to go through each one of these uh, uh, stages and we uh, have done this gradually with them. Next slide. Los, los goals, las metas este, de, que debían de cumplir esos, esos eh, healthcare providers, fueron descritas a nivel de decretos, de normativa del propio Ministerio de Salud e involucran los porcentajes que ustedes tienen a, eh, están visualizando. And the goals here were based on uh, different uh, decrees and uh, regulations uh, by the Ministry of Health and the percentages uh, and numbers you have them on the screen right here. ¿Cómo estamos hoy? Hoy, hoy tenemos más de 100 millones para 3.5 ciudadanos que cubren sus actos médicos en asistencia. Esos, esos más de 100 millones de documentos son digitales y son accesibles eh, para la continuidad asistencial. Hoy el 82% de la producción sanitaria del Uruguay está digitalizada y el 95% de los ciudadanos tienen acceso a su historia clínica electrónica. So 82% of uh, the um, medical records of uh, Uruguay are um, exactly that, are made uh, digitally or digitized, and 95% of the population has access to those digi digital documents. We have uh, more than 100 million clinical events that, that we uh, cover, that is to say, uh, in connection with 3.5 uh, citizens. Uh, and this is where we are uh, today. We, um, uh, this is the, the picture that we can paint on healthcare today. Okay, and next slide. El primer caso, entrando ahora el tema, el tema de la pandemia, nuestro primer caso confirmado en Uruguay fue el 13 de marzo del 20. So, about the pandemic uh, on March 13, 2020, we have the first confirmed case for COVID in Uruguay. Como muchos países se tomaron estrategias, la nuestra este, tenía que ver con el tracing, testing, and isolation. Y we generamos... had a number of strategies that we took in Uruguay. The first strategy had to do with uh, tracing, testing, and isolation. Y generamos una estrategia digital que acompañara la estrategia de salud. And what we did is we uh, provided a digital strategy to support the healthcare strategy as well. Next slide. La decisión más importante que se tomó a nivel de gobierno fue eh, un eslogan de quédense en su casa y no tuvimos cuarentena. The most important decision that was made at the government level was to stay at home and we did not have quarantine. Next slide. So, eh, parte de la estrategia digital fue cómo llegábamos al ciudadano este, con información y con servicios. Básicamente, eh, se generó una app y otros canales que estuvieron a lo largo del tiempo generando nuevos este, y mejores servicios para la ciudadanía para la contención de la pandemia. So, basically, here the idea, part of the strategy, was to see how we could reach out to the citizen with information and also with services. So to that end, we created an app and other channels that throughout the time allowed us to 
provide better and new services for the citizenship and to provide them during the pandemic. Next slide. Aquí está la, la omnicanalidad que les decíamos. No todo el mundo es digital, pero efectivamente tenemos un alto porcentaje de la, de, de la ciudadanía que utiliza medios digitales. Entonces estaba en la app, estaba una página web, un asistente virtual, un chatbot, un WhatsApp, un Facebook Messenger y evidentemente un call center. Toda esa información se centralizaba y llegaban al circuito de los healthcare providers. So, Here, this is what we talked about, the virtual environment. Not everyone is on the digital, uh, connected digitally, but we have a high number of citizens that do use digital means. We have the web page, we have Facebook, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and clearly a call center. All of this was put together, and this was the way to finally look back to the provider. Next slide. Esto es posible porque en Uruguay tenemos la conectividad asegurada para todos los establecimientos de salud en una red privada. This is possible because in Uruguay we have digital connectivity guaranteed for all providers as part of the private network. Next slide. Fuimos el, el primer país en, en Latinoamérica y el segundo o el tercero este, en incorporar la tecnología de contact tracing dentro de nuestra app. We were uh, the first country in Latin America and the second one or third one to, uh, worldwide to include contact tracing as part of the app. Next slide. Bueno, esa, esas son las, las notas este, del CEO de Google a Napoli hacia el presidente de la República. Well, this is the communication from Google CEO to our president. Next slide. Uh, press the button, please. And the other one. So, uh, no, okay. Um, lo último que, que trabajamos a nivel digital fue la agenda para la vacunación, para el plan de vacunación y los sistemas de registro de las vacunas y generamos a través de la, de la app el certificado digital de la vacuna COVID-19. So the last step that we worked on from the digital point of view was the agenda for the vaccination campaign, for the immunization campaign, the system to register the vaccines, and we created through the app the digital certificate for the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Ese certificado también uno se lo puede descargar desde el sitio web con un comprobante de firma digital. This um, certificate can, only, can also be downloaded from the website and it also includes a digital signature feature. Next slide. Next slide. Eh, uno de los proyectos que llevamos adelante a través de, de un bien público regional que incluye a todos estos países de Latinoamérica y el Caribe es hacer un intercambio del pasaporte digital o del certificado digital de vacuna. So, one uh, of the projects that we carried out through a, a regional approach, and this includes all of these countries from Latin America and the Caribbean, was to exchange the digital password or the digital certificate for vaccination. Next slide. Y estamos trabajando en el grupo de trabajo de la JU para que efectivamente ese, este certificado se transforme en un pasaporte sanitario y tenga validez en todos los países del mundo. We're working with WHO to have this certificate become a health passport so that it becomes valid throughout the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Pablo. Thank you, everyone. And um, next we'll have Tommy. Just so everyone knows, our session got extended an extra 15 minutes. So uh, Tommy, take it away and continue to drop your questions in the chat, everyone. Okay, will do. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jessica. So uh, what I'm wanting to talk about here is, 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 is another tool here, this tool of economic evaluation and how we can apply it to digital health. And when I use the term economic evaluation, I'm thinking about that, that basic idea of assessing two or more competing invent, interventions in terms of their costs and their consequences. And so really what that gets is this, is this concept of value or, or you know, what, what aspects of this intervention matter uh, and what should we, what should we assess? Um, and so in the COVID environment, many of these investment decisions you know, out of necessity, sort of out of the urgency, um, and the lack of uh, available data and sort of the shifting um, uh, nature of the evidence base, a lot of the investments, both digital and non-digital, were, were, were being made quite rapidly without a lot of economic evaluation um, to support them. But I think we're going to see this, this, this picture change, um, and especially around the, the opportunities for digital in, in investments um, to, 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 um, uh, to combat COVID and, um, and to be used within the, within the COVID um, pandemic. So as this evidence becomes available, um, this idea of economic evaluations, assessing what the costs are, assessing what the impact are, is, uh, will really help us to make uh, really smart, smart investments and use our money in the best way possible. Um, so we're, we're looking at the right interventions, uh, enabling us to sort of catalyze and, and leverage other sources of investment, um, and also to, to um, facilitate the implementation um, and scale up that's so, so highly needed. Next slide, thanks Jess. Um, but but this is an, an ongoing issue within within economics and uh, economic evaluation, sort of writ, writ large, um, and it's a bit exacerbated though in in our digital uh, in, when we come to digital health in, interventions. Um, uh, but it's it's also particularly needed because some of our digital health interventions that we've got available, some of them represent really really good investments. Uh, the impact, the potential impact, um, uh, and the uh, relative to the amount of spend or the investment, both both in the short term and the long term, uh, means that the, the investment prospect um, looks like you know, really, a really good investment. Um, however, other digital health interventions, it's not all one way, um, potentially represent very poor investments. Uh, it might be because the investment cost is too, is too high, uh, the, the potential impact that we're likely to, to, um, to, to get uh, might be highly uncertain, uh, and there might, there, there might be many, many dynamics uh, associated with the context and the implementation uh, which means the, the digital health will, uh, intervention might, might be a very poor use of money. Um, and so to get at this question of what's poor and, and what's good, obviously there's a, there's a sort of financial question. Uh, but when we look about economic evaluation, we're not only talking about financial impact, we're saying what's the costs relative to the consequence. And so then we get to the heart of you know, the consequences, what, what matters? Uh, and this is the idea of value. Um, and so we, we need to unpack what value means. Thanks, yes, you can go to the next slide here what uh, value means in, in the context of DHIs. Um, but to answer that question as well, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So there's a question of asking what's already been done, what's already out there. Um, and thanks, already there's a, a great conversation I can see here on the evidence available for digital health interventions. And Marilise, thank you for, for usefully posting that link so everyone can, can, can access that. Um, and that was a, an initiative that, that we worked on to, to cast our net wide and say, well, what has been published? Next slide, please, Jess. Um, and, and without going into too much detail on it, we can, we can see these were the, the, sort of the outcomes that we are looking at. Um, and you can see a broad range here. So this is, this, is what, this is what the researchers are publishing, right? So this is what they're saying, okay, this is what, um, so if it's back one slide, sorry, Jess. This is, one, this, this is what the uh, outcomes in the economic evaluation. So this is what the researchers think uh, are important as outcomes um, and what they think the readers think are, are important. Um, and I'll just highlight the economic outcomes there. Next slide, please, Jess. Um, and that when we do look at the economic uh, outcomes, they're, they're, some of them are useful for decision making, uh, but some of them are a bit insufficient. Now, if you're presenting uh, costs only, that's somewhat useful, uh, but it only it's just a flat, you know, a, a static measure. How much did it cost for implementation or cost per, um, you know, uh, you know ju just to, to um, implement the, uh, the intervention. Now, really what's helpful for decision making is when we get into this field of cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis and cost benefit analysis. Now we actually found zero uh, cost benefit analysis, a, a small pocket of, of cost utility analysis. That's when they're, 
doing a cost per you know, broad health outcome, like a, many might know a, a disability adjusted year or a quality adjusted life year. So these sort of measures of general health. Um, uh, so we saw a real mixed bag, but really there's a, there's a potential for improvement in the economic evaluation evidence base uh, for digital health interventions. Thanks, Jess. Um, and so how do we break this down? How, how, do we, how do we sort of conceptualize it and put it into a bit of a, a framework? Well, well, the first step um, is thinking about our, our different audiences. So we've really got this, this idea of investors. Um, so they can be the governments, they can be development partners. So, so who's, who's putting down money um, to, to make this digital health intervention implemented at country level? Uh, we've got the developers themselves. Um, uh, so they could be private and, and publicly funded. Um, and you've got the researchers as well. So they're, they're the ones you're assessing these and, and doing the publications and saying, okay, this is how we're going to conduct our analysis. This is how we're going to conduct um, uh, and assess costs and assess consequences. Um, now, pulling these things together, so, so getting to a common uh, place where we're talking about the different understanding of what value means to these different audiences, um, then we can get to, then we're talking the same, the same language, right? Then we can say, well, uh, when I talk about the cost for implementation or a cost per certain outcome, we all know what we're talking about. Um, and we could be on the same page when it comes to identifying good investments um, and bad investments and really acknowledging the value incorporates, um, especially within digital space, um, a, a lot of these different things, patient experience, um, impact on equity, um, even the, the data that's being produced as a result of the digital health intervention, that's got its own value as well, potential for disruption, um, and of course, they're all important, you know, just straight up costs, implementation and long term as well. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this is where we're going with this. So, so this is the, the digital health intervention economic evaluation framework. Now, there's existing frameworks um, uh, for those in the field um, will be familiar with them for uh, regarding sort of cost effectiveness analysis for those helping benefit cost analysis and, and, and every type of ec economic evaluation you could think of. But there's not much around um, guidance for, for those conducting economic evaluation um, of digital health. Um, and so this, this draws on the best practice of, of economic evaluation sort of methodology, uh, but really tailored towards the, the nuance um, of, of digital health interventions. Um, and so right at the top there, and, and this comes through, you'd see from, from, from Gabriel's presentation and also Pablo mentioned as well, the importance of, of context. So who's our decision maker? What, to, you know, what is the location? Uh, digital health interventions don't have a value in their own right. They don't have sort of an absolute value that's sort of equally generalizable around the globe. It's very context specific. The next step is around um, uh, defining exactly what we're, what we're talking about, the type of intervention, looking at the level of complexity, applying these basic analytical principles. So how do we choose what the comparator is? What sort of time frame our analysis is going over? Um, and then this all important idea of value proposition. How are we aggregating this value up? Um, are we doing sort of type inventories where we list a lot of the consequences and costs, um, or we're using the tools to combine um, combine value, produce things such as you know return on investment. Next slide. I'll, I'll do a very brief um, uh, touch on so two of those steps here. So this level of complexity and this particularly uh, important for digital health interventions and when we're talking about economic evaluation and really understanding this complexity and, and acknowledging how this how this um, impacts on the uncertainty of your investment is, is critical here. So when we talk about in complexity, we're talking about intervention complexity. So they're not just a simple tablet that you take and has, a, have a, has an effect. Often there's lots and lots going on and multi attributes um, uh, of the intervention itself. Uh, outcomes themselves as well are not, are not straightforward as we saw in the evidence base. Um, and then particularly in digital health as well, this idea of sort of causal pathway um, so that your digital intervention uh, will have might have this immediate effect on, on the on the user, but it might have this broader sort of health system impact and sort of this this um, domino effect of, of either benefit or negative effects as well. And economic evaluation, you're really trying to capture all of these things. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Um, and then this is a bit more uh, info on the on the, the different principles that would apply. And, and as I said, this would be common to a lot of economic evaluation sort of methodology writ large. Um, but just having a common way of presenting these um, and talking about them allows us this, this comparability. So we know one economic evaluation would be, would be comparable to another that was done at another time. And this gets into how do I choose the comparator? What sort of time frame, for example? Next slide. Um, and so this is, this is an ongoing development. We're looking at um, piloting it um, in another, a number of, sort of digital intervention types and decision spaces. Um, and it's critical to engage um, with lots of stakeholders. This can't be a sort of an ivory tower sort of um, you know, academic exercise where we just put out some guidance. 
this needs to, to um, have a lot of engagement, which, which we have had uh, with lots of different stakeholders and really applying it uh, in the real world. Um, and there's a lot of work to go on here as well. So there's sort of the applied work to, to, to see how it works in practice. Uh, there's some still things to unpack about things about the causal pathway and also how we're representing you know, critical things of digital and such as trust and privacy and the role that that, that plays in the economic valuation space. So I'll, I'll stop there and I wanted to give um, time for, for us to, to, to have um, queries as well. So I'll hand, hand over to, to Jessica um, and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, we will have a few minutes for Q&A. So um, to start, I found actually a great question um, for Pablo, um, which is from Adriana. So Pablo, for countries that are potentially less further along in their digital journey, um, what lessons do you think are most important from Uruguay's experience with COVID digital health examples? Well, um, first, of all, first of all, we think that the, all the fundamentals of the digital health that we've done uh, in the past years was the strongest for, for applying a digital strategy for the pandemic. The, 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 the most um, useful tools that, that we seen we was the, the app because it, it was so friendly to use that uh, any citizen can, can register uh, symptoms or, 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 a, or can consult uh, some questions of, of how, is, how do you feel about the, the, this illness. So, after that, uh, a doctor, a uh, medical doctor, chat with him or call in, in a video in a video call and make an evaluation. And perhaps he needs an, a test. So in the app will be the, 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 the result of the test. And the other thing we do in the app was you can you you can schedule. To, to, to go into to take your vaccines and after that you, you have your certificate so the, we think that the, the, the app was a, a very useful tool that half of the citizens of my country use it uh, every day so we think it, it was it was our goal in the in, in the tools on, on the pandemic. Great thank you and um... I guess I, kind of to bounce off that question, Pablo, someone asked earlier in the chat, do you feel um, the human adoption barriers are greater on the health system side or on the patient side? And in your experience, yeah. what do you think is larger? <laughs> yeah, in the, in the healthcare system side, yeah. Because um, uh, well, our strategy was that uh, we, we don't change any any information system for healthcare providers. They they use what they have, so they, they, they uh, we don't go with a with a new application. So you must you must uh, use it this to the clinical or uh, doc, uh, uh, doctors. So so we what you are doing, what you are using it. So let's let's change data between standards and interoperability. So this, 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 this was good, but uh, the use of the technology, they, they, they have, have a teleconsultation, so uh, can chat with the, with the, with the patient. It, it, was, uh, it, it was a barrier, but, but, but they, they do it. So it's, it's part of the acceleration of the, of the use of uh, digital channels that all of us use uh, 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 see today in with the pandemic is part of the acceleration. Uh, uh, the, the the great the great challenge now is how we must sustain that. How how we do that in in a normal process of health uh, of delivery health. So that that's our challenge today. Thank you, and I think. Um... Along that line, I'll open it to everyone of where do you see these, uh, the future of digital health and how do you feel with 
how has COVID accelerated digital health in your mind from your experiences and what are still the gaps to overcome this pilotitis versus uh, scalable, sustainable models? Um, I'll open it to anyone, Gabriel, Marlies, Tommy, or Pablo on your thoughts. Jessica, let me let me share my thoughts. I, I think if we look back at what we learned from Ebola, I think there was a, um, a lot of excitement at the opportunity of digital health in a in a post Ebola environment. And I think some of that dissipated quite quickly after um, the pandemic and the, and the crisis was over. And so I think the one lesson that we can take from this is how do we prevent this from happening in COVID? And I, th I think we can do that by focusing on redesigning the health system itself, right? And not in try and plug in a digital health solution into a system that is currently not operating well. So if we start from the perspective of the health system, who receives care for what, where, and understanding our clients much better, um, then I think we can design digital health solutions that are relevant to what we want the system of the future to look like. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank I you, also wanna, wanted to add as well, um, when looking at Pablo's uh, slides, the development of, of previous other initiatives such as the, the electronic medical records for all the population and the governance and the regulation as well, the, the, that framework also load for the next uh, series of applications like the COVID to be more uh, robust and to be uh, used and to be also decision database on the other, other systems, that, that one aspect. The other, um, I think it's, it's the digital skills, right? So indeed there is really a lack of capabilities on this area in, in not only in the healthcare system, but also at the, at the national level, at the decision maker level, and also at the patient level. So we really need to think about how can we invest in these digital skills uh, as part of, of, of education, right? So we can take the best of, um, we can really understand the, 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 um, the advantages of, uh, of these digital health interventions once, as Marilis mentioned before, we need to make another changes, not only be thinking on the technology, but really thinking on the problems as we, as we mentioned. And, and therefore digital skills are a very important thing to, to invest. And also some kind of really ownership uh, at, the, at, the, at the central side, at the government side on these initiatives. So really to own it and, and, and feel that it's part of really a, a strategy, medium long-term strategy for the country. And just one last element, I think that slide that Pablo mentioned in the, the way that the app was developed in terms of many versions, small versions, and in every version you add a new thing, you're taking kind of an agile approach. So you need to really roll out fast. So maybe you don't have the, the, the most complete application, but just you have you know these add-ons that responds to the different challenge that happened during all every day with, with COVID. So I think it's that was also an interesting strategy in terms of how can we put something uh, to start working and, and thinking really on, on these quick wins that we mentioned in the beginning. Over. And I think just, I, I could just come in then and just to agree with my, my colleagues as well, perhaps just one other sort of indirect uh, impact here is that, you know, as a result of COVID, everyone's become an epidemiologist, right? So everyone's sort of, a, a, a sort of a embracing the idea of data and, you know, uh, you know acknowledging the power of, of data and sort of interested in um, you know, different different elements of data, and, and, and in the sense that digital goes hand in hand, hand with with data, that's really opened up a real opportunity for for digital health as well. Both um, so so there's the sort of direct COVID um, ideas, but then just acknowledging the role that digital can play in our health systems, and the role and the role that can play in the generation of evidence and generate a, a generation of useful data will be I think will be a lasting a lasting impact. Thank you, thank you all. Yeah, I think um, Pablo's example of Uruguay's experience with this foundation of digital really allowed them to then leapfrog and become agile to the changing pandemic. I think one, one question that goes with the last question in the chat is, 
this idea of the last frontier. How do we get um, low middle income countries um, on this digital foundation such as Uruguay? And similarly, Pauline asked, um, did you find whether the use of apps digital is less utilized or difficult for older or less tech savvy populations? So kind of on that last frontier meeting, grabbing the last people within populations and in different countries. Um, what do you guys think about meeting that gap? How, how has Uruguay maybe addressed the issue of less tech savvy populations or older populations, Pablo? Well, I, I, I think that that the strategic at the at the political level is 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 one of the of the main issue that that any 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 digital health um, strategy can can done as 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 a foundation because. Um, what we do it, we do it for all the population. No, no matter what kind of population are, what what uh, if they if they if they the deliveries of the of the health services are public or private, we, we don't care. We we, we have uh, the same strategy, and and we have, we have a, a, an adoption plan for for everyone, every healthcare provider, and, and all this, the 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 professionals that works in the in the health system. So um, we focus in, in the patient, we focus in the citizen, but the a, a same strategy to 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 board all the all all the needs of the population. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And I think just to build on that for maybe Gabriel or, or Marlies or Tommy what are your thoughts on that um the last frontier of low middle income countries where do you think they should start um and how can they get to a foundation of digital health or digital technologies so um complementing the 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 answer that Marlies put in the, in the chat i think that the first thing, and, and I, it was funny, I just heard, I was hearing yesterday a session on aging and technology. And this person, I think it was from Google, I think, but, but she says, do not assume, right? So the first thing is just not assume what are the different uh, uh, skills or capabilities of, of the different populations, right? So you, you just get this assumption. So you start creating things, assuming things that maybe are not true or maybe yes. So the, the solution is really to build together Right, build with the population, understand the population. And that's why I think this is general, not only for aging, but also in low and middle income context, is really this exercise of a digital health assessment, but a really comprehensive one because many have already done in terms of assessment, but we need really to build this comprehensive assessment together with the government, together with the stakeholders, together with the end users. And once you have this a, a, a perspective of the readiness of maturity, then plan, plan, plan this roadmap again together with the users, being every, all the stakeholders that you, that you think. In that way, you have an approach that takes in account all the needs and do not assume, but really builds uh, together with the final users. That's my, my take. I think maybe just just to add that that uh, we wouldn't call it sort of the final frontier, but maybe the final frontiers. You know, there, there's many different contexts uh, that we must take into account, and um, you know, a country that uh, isn't advanced in its in its maturity. Um, you know, comparing that to to another country within that basket of LMICs uh, would be would be a mistake. Uh, you know, spending two hundred US dollars per per head is, is vastly different health system to one that spends two thousand US dollars per head. So. Uh, but that highlights this idea, as, as Gabriel said, and I think the, the reoccurring theme through this session has been the, the importance of context um, and, and assessing at, at a local level um, and then identifying what are those interventions that, that are right for that, that particular context. Great, thank you. Marlies, maybe I'll have you weigh in on that too, if you'd like, and then for our 
our final question as we're just about out of time is, um, are you seeing lower income governments um, more willing to invest versus looking for partners to fund? So I, you know, building on what, um, what Pablo, Gabriel and Tommy have said, I, I will only say that I think, I think good solid plans find funding, right? And what I, what I mean by that is that, you know, we're always going to find in low and low and middle income countries that funding is a combination of government funding and, um, you know, development partner financing. And I think those always, and, and other concessional financing means, I think those need to need to work together and in, in synchronization. I think the challenge at the moment, I'm not suggesting financing is not a challenge, right? But I think it is about joining the dots and bringing all the disparate in, um, investments together in a, in a national integrated plan that says, this is what partner one is doing. This is what the government is doing. This is how all these pieces fit together. Because, I, and I think if we can get that right, right? If we can um, help support governments that that innovations in digital health are not driven by development partners or technology companies that come with, to them with solutions, but that the government is, is saying, this is our plan and let's figure out how the support that you can provide fits into that plan. I think if we can change that dialogue that is an important step in helping to make sure, obviously, and when we need the digital health, we need regulations, we need data privacy, consent, all those things to be built into that as well. But I, you know, I think that when we, to me, the biggest challenge in, in digital health is which solutions are right for this country's particular context, and how do we scale and not continue this culture of, of pilotitis? And I think if we can get that right, the right financing will follow, not suggesting it's an insignificant challenge, but I think it's not the number one challenge. Uh, I think it's, this is a case of, of getting the plan, getting the puzzle pieces to line up and then figure out the, the, the different financing sources for the, for the puzzle pieces, so to speak. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, great answer. Um, and just to wrap up, I wanna give a special thanks to all of our speakers and and my participants and the patients today apparently we're still learning how to use zoom and interpreters in our new digital world <laughs> from covid um, but to wrap up i'd love to just give it to pablo one more time and say for everyone listening what what's the biggest lesson learned from uruguay if you had to give them all one tip one final parting piece um, in your experience from all your many experiences your final takeaway. Uh, thank you, thank you for the for the invitation. It was a pleasure to 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 join with with all of you, with Gabriel and Thomas and Marilis. Um The the big lesson is um, to wait because this is this is a, a mid and long term project. So we must keep quick wins, but uh we must wait uh, this is a process this is uh, a, 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 an adoption you need to to be to be to have a good foundation to 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 accelerate process but to to going forward and moving forward in continuous way so just wait uh, do it right do it with the with the uh, with a global strategy political views must must join must accept must uh, be compromised with the with the initiative with the project so take the risk wonderful thank you thank you all um i think it might just kick us out in a few seconds so Thank you all for coming and have a wonderful rest of your day.